the angle of attack. The airplane attitude is defined as the angle between the longitudinal axis and the horizontal reference. Angle of attack is equal to the algebraic difference between airplane attitude and flight path. Normally, an F-106 will fly its approach at about a 12 degree angle of attack with an attitude angle of 9 degrees, which is what we saw this man flying on the last approach. Is that clear to you? Yes, but I'm still in the dark as to why it takes more power to fly at slower speeds. Okay, let's look for a second at the lift and drag curves of an F-106 compared to a C-33. First of all, we'll look at a parameter of the aero people call coefficient of lift. But for our purposes, let's just consider it lift versus angle of attack. The coefficient of lift increases proportionately until you reach the stall point where it suddenly breaks and falls rapidly away. The F-106 characteristic is a bit different, initially about the same, but as alpha increases, the curve flattens and goes over the top gently without a sharp break. The drag characteristics of the C-33 are about like so. They increase more or less proportionately as the increase in angle of attack. However, in the F-106, you'll notice that the higher angles of attack the slope of the drag curve increases more rapidly than it does for a straight wing airplane. Is that clear, Dave? Raj, that's clear. But what's the story on this thrust required, thrust available I've heard so much about? Now this is a subject that has been kicked around rather loosely. Here's a diagram which shows thrust required, thrust available for an F-106. Let me explain first of all what this is. This particular curve is a plot of the points at which the airplane will fly in stabilized flight at a particular gross weight and power setting. Now this curve was plotted for say 30,000 pounds gross weight with the gear extended. Pick a point on this curve. At this particular point we are stabilized at 210 knots which requires this much thrust. Now we slow the airplane to 190 by reducing power. Flying stabilized at 190 requires only this much thrust. Okay, now we go on down until we reach the point where minimum thrust is required. As we further decrease the speed, it requires more and more power to maintain level flight. You notice as we go to this point, it requires more thrust than it did at this point or this point. This chart also shows angle of attack. Out here at 210 knots, we had an angle of attack of about 4 degrees. Down here at 180 knots, we have an angle of attack of about 10 degrees. Alright, now remember on our plot of drag versus angle of attack, how the drag increased with alpha, this creates the up sweep in the thrust required curve. Now let's take a look at this overlay of a C-33. Note how flat this curve is compared to the curve of an F-106 with its low aspect delta wing. All Century series have a thrust required curve which is much deeper than that of a C-33. This straight line represents the thrust available at military power. At any point, the distance between the thrust available and the thrust required represents the excess thrust available to accelerate the airplane. Well, just where does think rate tie into this? Well, that's a good question. In order to understand the significance of think rate, I think we should refresh our basic physics a bit. Here's our source. Old Isaac Newton is responsible for the theories we're talking about. A body in motion continues oh, in motion oh, oh, oh. unless acted on by an external force. The force required to accelerate the body is proportional to the mass of the object. Oh, oh, oh. 
Now, why didn't I think of that before? Newton's laws are the basic laws of motion and apply to aviation. He'd probably be pretty mixed up if he could see what we've done with his ideas. Mixed up indeed. I practically invented aviation. Airplanes fly in accordance with the laws I established. The laws from which thrust, lift, speed, drag curves are derived. Now, as we apply to... Mr. Myers, if you please. These curves are merely lines on a graph which show the relationship between the forces acting on an airplane during flight. Lift, gravity, speed, and drag. Now, how do we arrive at the power curve? We start by explaining that if flying at a constant angle of attack, lift will increase as the square of the speed. Double the speed... Four times the lift. Double the speed again. Sixteen times as much lift. Now, let us examine the effect of drag due to lift by observing a delta wing in slip speed. At an angle of ten degrees, the wing produces air quantity of lift and D quantity of drag. Now, increase the angle of attack to sixteen degrees and note the relative increase in lift and drag. Because we are working in a high angle of attack region with a low aspect ratio wing, drag increase is much greater proportionately than the increase in lift. Here's the second kind of drag, parasite drag. This comes from friction and normal frontal surface drag external tanks and such. It increases as the square of the speed. We now add these two drags together to give us total drag. We can just think of this total drag as thrust required, since every pound of drag requires a pound of thrust to offset it. This line represents the thrust available. As the thrust required rises past the thrust available, you have a falling airplane instead of a flying machine. The sacrifice of altitude is the only way out. You're on the back side of the thrust curve. Don't fight it. It's the law. So there's the theory behind the thrust required curve. Well, I understand the theory behind the thrust and drag curve, but just how does a pilot recognize a problem when he's in flight? In conventional aircraft, that is, with a straight wing and tail. The low speed area has some obvious symptoms that help keep you out of trouble, such as heavy buffets or lateral and longitudinal instability. But the F-106 doesn't have these. Well, not nearly so obvious, anyhow. A delta wing pilot could fly into a very high drag region without enough warning to recover from a runaway rate of descent. How about afterburn? AB is the only recourse during a landing approach if you don't have altitude to spare. However, don't rely too heavily on your afterburner. Remember, it takes time to accelerate your bird even with full bore. Also remember, it takes time for a turbojet engine to wind up to full thrust. All this time, you may not have. The difference between the thrust required and the thrust available represents the margin of excess thrust for acceleration from the low speed area. You can see that at about 130 knots, there will be no thrust available for acceleration. Well, things sure have changed since the days of the spam can. They sure have. Just a few years ago, the mark of a hot fighter pilot was a very tight traffic pattern. 30 seconds from a hard break to touchdown was all in a day's work. This sort of approach involves pulling a tight turn at low level to the high rate of descent. Now, this is pretty dangerous, as evidenced by the number of troops that have spun in, even though their airplanes were considerably lighter and had better acceleration characteristics than our century series aircraft. 
Now let's examine such a pattern when flown with an F-106 and see if we can associate the things we've been talking about with what actually happened. At this point, the F-106 has reached the base leg in a 70-degree bank. The pilot has established a very high rate of descent, considerably above the correct glide slope. The descent can be altered only by the application of considerable opposing force for a period of time. Our pilot now realizes the wisdom of Newton's first law and attempts to provide an external force by increasing the angle of attack. This does slow the rate of descent momentarily, but by now, because of the increased drag associated with higher angle of attack, he has moved far to the backside of the thrust required curve where practically no excess thrust is available for acceleration. The result is inevitable. Although the airplane exhibited excellent control with mild buffeting as the only warning. Okay, I see the problem, but what's the solution? The days of the tight traffic pattern are old-fashioned. How would you fly a Century Series aircraft to stay out of this kind of trouble? Well, the answer is about as obvious as the problem. First of all, don't allow yourself to fly into this critical high-drag, low-thrust available area. Just what speeds do you recommend? I won't quote specific airspeeds, as they vary with gross weight. It's all in your flight manual. But let me describe a pattern for you which will keep you out of the pitfalls we've discussed. Your final approach should look like a GCA or an ILS, with about a 5,000 foot straightaway, wings level, 250 feet above the runway. The turn from base to final should be in a gentle bank not to exceed 30 degrees, with about 85% RPM. Now run through that for me, Dave. Well, my understanding of your explanation, considering a high-performance airplane, the pattern should be very similar to a GTA or an ILS approach, with a long straight-end approach similar to this, approximately 5,000 feet from the approach end of the runway, 250 feet off the ground. Now, the turn from base to final approach should not exceed 20 to 30 degrees of bank, using about 85% engine RPM. Right, that's right. Well, let's watch this approach. As you noted during our flight, the slow speed characteristics of the F-106 are excellent. Operate the aircraft inside the flight envelope for which it was designed during landing, as well as for the rest of the mission. You know, this makes sense. I think I'll go check for myself. Real good. Go on up and try an hour or so of racetrack patterns at 10,000 feet at approach speed. See how much thrust is required for various configurations and angles of attack. Okay, I sure will. Learn what your bird will do and what it won't. Thanks, Chuck. This time I'm going to hack it. Right. Oh, Mr. Myers, here's what you've been waiting for. I'm sorry it was delayed, but it was in you. Thank you, Audrey. Hey, Dave. Check this when you get a chance. 